This program is brought to you by Emory University. Uh, good afternoon, um, and thank you for joining us today for an afternoon of scholarship, dialogue, and community building. This event has been in the works for some time now, and we are glad that we were finally able to get the graduate student community, um, the visiting scholars, and faculty together and provide a space for everyone to get to know each other better. The event's going to begin with Jack Johnson, um, uh, the VHC's newest visiting scholar who's go going to present his work. And then uh, we'll lead into a reception, um, just a social hour where everyone can chat and mingle. So um, Jack is the VHC's newest visiting scholar. He's an assistant professor of politics at Whitman College. He received his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and earned his JD from the Cornell Law School with a certificate in public law. He is co-editor with Martha Feynman and Adam Romero of Feminist and Queer Legal Theory, Intimate Encounters, Uncomfortable Conversations. He has also published in History of the Present and the Harvard Civil Rights, Civil Liberties Law Review. While at Emory, Jack will be working on two projects. The first project entails an exploration of the potential challenges to constitutionalism posed by political movements on behalf of a so-called culture of life. The second offers a justification of the welfare state by pluralizing the concept of political freedom. He imagines that both projects will benefit from a sustained conversation with vulnerability theory. The title of his presentation today is The Welfare State and Political Freedom, Reflections on the Affordable Care Act. So please join me in welcoming Jack. Um, first, thank you for the uh, kind introduction. Um, I'd also like to thank Martha Feynman uh, for, for having me here and uh, also uh, uh, Rachel uh, for, for somehow helping me navigate everything logistically, which I fail at constantly. Um, so th thank you both. Um, the title of my talk today is The Welfare State and Political Freedom Reflections on the Affordable Care Act. Now, the passage of the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, occurred, I think, at a historically odd moment. That is, this has been a moment when the ascendancy and dominance of neoliberalism has already produced a multitude of eulogies. Eulogies for the welfare state, eulogies for non-market ends, and indeed eulogies for liberal democracy itself. I say this is an odd moment because against the neoliberal trifecta of deregulation, privatization, and withdrawal of the state from social welfare, the ACA stands as a rebuttal with its renewed regulation, redistribution, and welfare state expansion in the service of expanded health insurance and medical care. The ACA intensifies regulation of private insurance and legislatively socializes risk. The logic of privatization and individualization is further unwound by a redistributive regime of subsidies for those purchasing insurance on the newly created and regulated insurance exchanges. Perhaps most importantly, the law greatly expands the welfare state with the largest expansion of Medicaid since its, 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 since its inception in 1965. Now, even as many on the political left oppose neoliberal rationality and governance, there remains a leftist tradition that views the welfare state as a source and site of unfreedom, as primarily a network of disciplinary power or as a distraction from post-capitalist tomorrows and a deflection of the revolutionary fervor required to get us there. The classic articulation of the latter argument remains Marx's insistence that the advocates of the welfare state should be greeted with absolute, quote, mistrust, as they hope to do nothing more than, quote, bribe workers, end quote, into accepting a mere, quote, change of social conditions and thus prevent a transformation of the whole society, end quote. Or, as Wendy Brown has more recently argued, argued the welfare state fails to supply a commitment to emancipating the realm of production. Now, these two criticisms, I think, have been marginalized in the broader conflicts over welfare and U.S. political discourse. The public debate in the United States has progressed along different lines. Traditionally, libertarians have claimed the mantle of freedom to argue against progressive schemes of taxation and redistribution. The freedom of the wealthy under this account is unjustly violated by taxation, and the freedom of the recipient of the entitlement is hobbled by dependency. By contrast, welfare state advocates have more often invoked values other than freedom to defend the welfare state, such as a desire to protect the weak, or to ensure social stability, or to defend the principle of equality, or to strengthen the bonds of citizenship, or to generate a basic humanitarian floor below which no citizen can fall. 
Now, to be clear, the welfare state is neither necessarily synonymous with freedom, nor freedom singularly proper telos, but it is a mistake, I think, to render it per se alien, exterior, or antagonistic to freedom as a matter of historical practice or theoretical principle. Now, to open up our thinking about this question, I think it's useful to begin by considering the question of freedom and welfare from the shores of the marginalized left critiques, and those are uh, Marx and queer feminist. Indeed, I think the variety of critiques themselves invite us to think of the welfare state from a variety of angles, and thus pluralize our understanding of leftist politics and freedom. Now, our judgment about the welfare state should be particularized, but one must move outward to see it in broader terms. We should recall that the US welfare state includes some of the following, social security disability insurance, socialized old age pensions, socialized public education, Medicare, food stamps, Head Start, and Medicaid. All of these programs constitute the welfare state in the United States, but they are reducible to no single redistributive or political principle other than one, and that is the collective right of democracy to govern the material conditions of civil society and the political right to establish new property rather than to simply police extant forms. Now, the Af Affordable Care Act then represents first and foremost, I think, a freedom of democracy, a freedom of democracy over the prerogatives and presumptions of libertarian market freedom, an important reaffirmation of the freedom of democracy in a period defined by its increasing fragility. But other freedoms are enabled too, and they are the center of my presentation here today. The two freedoms I want to consider, a freedom of exit for workers and a queer freedom from biofamilial normativity and dependency. I'm going to take each of these in turn. Now, the ACA tends to the interest of workers as workers by defending and materially supporting a worker's freedom of exit. There are at least two different dimensions of this freedom interest the freedom to exit one job for another, and the freedom to exit the wage labor force in meaningful ways prior to old age. The expansion of Medicaid, coupled with income-based subsidies for the purchase of insurance within regulated market exchanges, empowers workers who are in a condition known as job lock. Job lock binds a worker to a particular job. Prior to the ACA, many workers with employment-based insurance could not leave the job they held due to the fear of losing health insurance for themselves and their families. Under the ACA, many more workers are now more free to exit their current employment relationship. Now, Marxist theory has been more critical than appreciative of this freedom. As John Elster has noted, Marxists have claimed that this particular freedom tends to generate the illusion that the worker is free, not only with respect to the individual capitalist, but with respect to capital as such. However, if capitalism is rendered conceptually and historically plural, then the particulars of this or that moment of capitalism are in fact, I think, capitalism as such. The condition of job lock is a material unfreedom that harkens back to pre-capitalist feudal forms. Karen Oren's exploration of the endurance of feudal practices and norms in US employment law well into the 20th century highlight this fact. And it is noteworthy, it is noteworthy that Oren identified an entire legal apparatus around employment designed in a manner to bind the worker to his job and to ward off interlopers which stood in contrast to the popular image of the free labor calculating, free laborer calculating his day-to-day -day advantage, ready to pick up and follow the highest bidder. Now, mobility is a freedom contra feudalism and contra capitalism when the former inhabits the latter as a matter of practice. Additionally, mobility must be defended as something other than an illusion to be discarded at some future moment of anti or post-capitalist emancipation lest the freedom of the worker be entirely devoured by a collective social power that produces the conditions whereby the individual is immediately and inexorably conscripted into industrial armies at the moment of freedom and emancipation. Now, the rhetorical conflation of emancipation with the establishment of industrial armies um, is made in Marx and Engels' The Communist Manifesto. And this conflation of industrial armies with social power signals, I think, a continuity across the frontiers of capitalist norms into communist imaginaries. Both place work at the center of life, and the latter locates work at the center of freedom. As labor becomes the realization and signature of humanity, exit from labor as an act or precondition of freedom becomes suspect. Even when the Marxist tradition has envisioned emancipation from work and life outside it, 
It has done so in contradiction to its own theoretical premises. Hannah Arendt noted this contradiction in the writings of Marx, and here I quote Arendt. In all stages of his work, he defines man as animal labyrinths, and, and then leads him into a society in which this greatest and most human power is no longer necessary. Now, in the 20th century, the contradiction was resolved in favor of what Kathy Weeks calls the productivist imperative in Marxism, and two options emerged as dominant. Product, um, socialist modernization, which emphasized more work, and socialist humanism, which emphasized better work, but in both cases, we were always led back to work. Now, understanding capitalist work structures to be at their hearts one of domination or expo exploitation, and for most human beings who labor under it both, and envisioning human beings as beings whose being is defined by something other than labor, requires freedom to be reconceptualized as unhinged from simply democratizing or revolutionizing the conditions of work, even if and when freedom demands that revolution of democratization of work. Freedom requires less work, and thus a criterion of judgment about the existence and expansion of the welfare state should be to the extent to which it transforms that goal into a material reality. In the words of Kathy Weeks, the political aim is not for liberation of work, but rather for a liberation from work. Of course, one could be thrown out of work and into the teeth of bare existence, and thus reminded of Marx's point that when survival is linked to laboring for a wage, the absence of labor turns existence into a question. Indeed, a hallmark of neoliberalism has been the emergence of an economy bereft of full-time, long-term employment, and overflowing with short-term contracts providing minimal benefits. Work precarity rather than labor monotony defines the neoliberal present, and may be one reason why the call for emancipation from work currently lacks political traction. Nonetheless, I think the task is to resist the impulse for a politics of full employment, and instead embrace contingency freed from the rule of hyperscarcity, competition, and anxiety. As neoliberalism evacuates from public life social meanings, political vocabularies, and normative reference points other than those drawn from economics, the pride of place once given to the citizen liberal democracy has been increasingly supplanted by the model neoliberal actor, and that is the entrepreneur. Perhaps ironically, or perhaps as a measure of neoliberal hegemony, some politicians explicitly reference the, quote, freeing of the entrepreneur as a reason to support the ACA's expansion of the welfare state. Indeed, liberal speaker of the House of Representatives, um, Nancy Pelosi, who helped shepherd the ACA towards enactment, said afterwards, and I quote Speaker Pelosi, we see this as an entrepreneurial bill, end quote. Now, one might be tempted to stop at this elevation of entrepreneurship and see in it an indictment of the limits of the legislation or the end of freedom beyond the contours of a neoliberal order in which contemporary neoliberal governance operates through isolating and entrepreneurializing responsible units and individuals. Without discounting such possibilities, it still might behoove us to think more intently about how, how, how the ACA creates the possibility for some people to exit not just their particular job, but the labor market entirely. Discursively, another figure appeared in the ACA debates as a potential alternative to the heroic entrepreneur, and that was the figure of the poet. In the same moment Speaker Pelosi was praising entrepreneurship, she also defended the ACA as enabling the pursuit of happiness in other directions. She celebrated, and I quote Speaker Pelosi, she celebrated people having the freedom to be self-employed, play music, write poetry, wherever their aspirations or talents take them, end quote. Unsurprisingly, the political right mocked and pilloried her for this justification. Equally unsurprising, but perhaps more disappointingly, some liberals insisted that the key point being made by Speaker Pelosi was in fact an entrepreneurial one, and that in here I quote uh, Jonathan Chait in the New Republic, Democrats are not, this is his emphasis, they dare not do this. Democrats are not, of course, proposing to provide some kind of welfare dole to individuals who wish to create art rather than work, end quote. This is the liberal defense of Pelosi, by the way. Um, happily, however, Democrats did in fact create a welfare program uh, for some individuals who would rather leave the wage labor market and create art. What some cite as a failure of the ACA should be re-evaluated, re I think, as a triumph. The ACA has reduced, according to CBO, the number of hours worked by the equivalent of 2.5 million jobs. Now, there's some controversy about that. It's not 2.5 million jobs were lost. It's the equivalent of labor hours. 
um, equals 2.5 million jobs. Um, so 2.5, the, the time equivalent, not the actual job, uh, was lost or reduced. Now, artists in the United States have long had to um, live either without health care or work in some capacity other than the arts to receive it. The availability of socialized health insurance helps negate the necessity of choosing between performing unfulfilling work and living life as an artist. As numerous testimonials from artists illustrate, the ACA makes it easier to carve out the time that makes it possible to be an artist. This freedom to exit the wage labor market, either entirely or in large measure, is more, I think, than, more than a bribe to workers, as Marx saw it. Rather, it is a victory born of political democracy by workers for the right to be something other than workers. And while making art may be a form of work, it is also an activity of autonomy, leisure, and non-work. The poet, the actor, the musician may appear to us today as curious subjects of freedom by contrast to either the entrepreneur or the heroic working class, but political theories and practices of freedom, I think, would be enriched by letting them take the stage. Now, the pluralization um, of emancipatory politics during the previous 40 years has also multiplied the sites of political struggle and opened the doors to claims of justice and visions of political freedom not tied primarily to the scene of labor, either revolutionizing the scene of labor or creating the conditions of exit from it. One such site um, of political contestation is the family. Queer politics has long had to wrestle with the question of freedom vis-a-vis -vis the family. Young people who do not conform to gender and or sexuality norms often face abandonment and abuse by their family. And so queer politics involves crafting the social and material conditions of emancipation from the biological family. Cuts in welfare state programs disproportionately impact queer youth as queer youth are disproportionately without familial support. The welfare state potentially opens the future to many queer youth and cuts the chain of dependency to hostile families. However, important components of the US welfare state have both presumed and reinforced a heteropatriarchal order. The welfare state has often been imagined as, necessarily, as necessary only as a safety net when privatized care systems fail catastrophically. As a result, heterosexually gendered divisions of care and market, with only the latter afforded the dignity of work, and public and private, with only the former designated as the proper realm of freedom, became the norm while the welfare state um, provision figured as the exception to it. Such an, ordered, uh, such an order privileged the heterosexual biological reproductive couple. At the same time, it masked both the domination within that unit and the dependent relationship that the market and public realm had upon those naturalized demarcations and inequalities. And for a, a more thoroughgoing exploration and critique of that, uh, one should see Martha Feynman's The Neutered Mother, um, as well as more recently, Joan Tronto's Caring Democracy. Under this regime, married women who labored in the home received no wage from either the market or the state. However, widows might be entitled to meager subsidies from the state, again, exemplifying the fact that it's an exception when the privatized norm fails. And even today, there remains not only a presumption of privatized care, but the conjunction of care with the reproductive bond. Anna Marie Smith has described the 1996 Welfare Reform Act um, and this, uh, she's coined the phrase paternal affair, and here's Anne-Marie Smith's description of the 1996 bill, quoting Anne-Marie. The state is broadcasting the message that a mere biological tie constitutes a sufficient basis for fatherhood, that women with children should be dependent upon the children's father, and that the father ought to provide for the children. The idea that the biological father is the appropriate source of material support for children carries with it, in our bourgeois context, an implicit presumption the one who pays is the one who should govern, end quote. Now, the welfare state can either buttress the one who governs or facilitate self-government for those who have historically been governed. That is, I don't think there's anything uh, logically or necessarily that flows towards prefer to turn affair. That is, I think it's, it's a question of historical and political contestation. Um, and in this contest, in this political contest between the welfare state being on the side of those who have historically been governed or to facilitate self-government, I think the ACA makes an important, if halting and still incomplete, uh, contribution by socializing health insurance. One particular component of the ACA rejects the normative thrust of paternal affair and offers one possible vision for queering the family and the state. 
the expansion of Medicaid to those who graduate out of foster care in the United States. Queer kids are overly represented in the foster care system, but even self-identified straight kids in the foster care system are, I think, in a queer relationship to the normativity of the biological family. There are over 400,000 young people living in foster care, and they lack the familial connection to access the ACA provision that allows parents to extend coverage to their children until the age of 26. The ACA, however, created a parallel provision that grants Medicaid coverage to those who leave foster care at the age of 18 and covers them on Medicaid until they reach the age of 26. Importantly, Medicaid will be provided to this group even if their income exceeds the normal income limit imposed upon Medicaid, and the law makes absolutely no requirement that they track down their biological family prior to or after receiving the benefit, so in contradiction to the 1996 Welfare Reform Act. Now, the welfare state is never without norms, and I, it's um, I, almost impossible to imagine a welfare state um, devoid of them. But I think its disciplinary mechanisms may be both loosened and redirected towards queer understandings of freedom. Almost unnoticed, the ACA has done more for queer emancipation than any other contemporary federal government program or provision. While the mainstream LGBT rights organizations have embraced the ideal of middle class normality, the material lives of many suffer from orders of distribution and entitlement that do not match the realities of their lives. The ACA is but a small step, but an important one in closing that gap. Consequently, there is no possibility for a queer politics of freedom without resistance to neoliberalism and its relentless logic of ahistorical and decontextualized individualism as freedom, along with its presumptions of a caring family somewhere behind the scenes. Now, to conclude today, I want to reflect briefly on how the argument I'm making here converges with vulnerability theory. Um, I think it converges with vulnerability theory in three important ways. Um, first, in the argument I'm making, freedom here is not tethered to an anti-discrimination paradigm. That is, um, the argument of freedom here is in, in no way going to be litigated through a 14th Amendment uh, state, state action claim. The problem when we consider freedom and work is not in this instance discrimination at work. So it's not even a question of a civil rights law mandating anti-discrimination. The question is the structure of work itself. Um, the structure of work itself. So it's a conceptualization of freedom that's not antagonistic to an anti-discrimination paradigm, but different, it, 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 raising different questions um, uh, for freedom. Also with foster care, um, the foster care example in, in the Medicaid parallel. Again, the, my concern here begins with LGBT youth, um, but it doesn't stop with LGBT youth. That is, it's not an exclusive concern, it's, it's a beginning concern of thinking of queer politics. So in this sense, it's a queer political conceptualization of freedom that is moving beyond any kind of discrete and insular sexual identity which could make an anti-discrimination claim. So in that sense, I think that's the first important convergence with vulnerability theory is loosening our connection to an anti-discrimination um, anti paradigm, particularly through um, concerns with state action. Um, second convergence, I think, with my argument and the vulnerability project um, is that in, in this, uh, my argument, neither the market nor the family is taken as a, a historical or a given. That is, both the workplace and the, and the biological heterosexual reproductive family um, both have histories and both are open to political change and reimagination. And moreover, neither of these sites is envisioned as a primary source of freedom in the historical present. That both of these are posing problems uh, for political freedom rather than some sort of a, a place of refuge um, um, from the world or a place in which freedom might uh, naturally find home and emanate. So that's the second primary convergence, I think, with vulnerability theory. Third, um, in, my under, in my argument here about uh, the thinking about the welfare state in general, but the ACA in particular, uh, as being a, a source inside of facilitating political freedom. Under this understanding, for the state is active, the state is democratic, and it's socialist. And I think um, those converge um, with, with the vulnerabilities argument for a responsive state. And I'll say it again, it's active in the sense that it is intervening, and it's intervening as a matter of norm, not as exception. It's democratic. Um, that is, it answers to the many, or as Justice Ginsburg, Justice Ginsburg said in an FIB versus Sibelius, uh, on those who labor. It's, it's, those, it's a law that 
speaks on behalf of those who labor. It's the many. It's not the citizens of Citizens United um, as a democratic state. And it's socialist. It's socialist in this, to the extent that it redistributes from the top down. And it's also socialist to the extent that it insists upon subordinating market to politics uh, rather than allowing markets to uh, lay claim to political vocabularies and domains. So again, I think those are three convergences. Um, the first is that it's not tethered to an anti-discrimination paradigm. The second, neither the family nor the market is treated as natural. And third, it insists upon a responsive active state that is both democratic and socialist. Thank you. Is the text you were you were uh, presenting from is that available for us in a? Uh, are you circulating it as a preliminary? It, it, I'm hoping that it will be published uh, early this year, but I, I can I'm, I can circulate a draft. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, um, I just want to follow up on your last point about the markets not being taken as a given. So I mean, it's not a. And one could one could easily imagine right, a universal, public, publicly funded um, healthcare system that would seem to track um, a lot of the, the points that you've already made. Necessarily privilege, uh, uh, heterosexual family, and but the the system that was adopted, um, one could argue, does operate to uh, near to the benefit of big insurance companies. Right, and they were heavily involved in crafting it and so forth. Um, so if, if, is there a tension there between the idea that markets aren't taken as a given um, and that this big market force um, had such a role in, uh, in creating it um, and uh, it's bolstered? I, I actually think the, I think the AC actually demonstrates. So if you, if you ask me my preference would be Medicare for all or so, something along those lines, just naturalize the health insurance. But I think what the ACA does, and it's compromises to and with uh, private insurance, which is still important to note, it, it's still a, a socialist mechanism through private insurance. So they're not absolutely incompatible. But to your question about natural naturalness, um, it seems to me the ACA in that moment demonstrates precisely that it's, it's not natural, right? Because the, the insurance markets are being reconfigured through the individual mandate. And this is what the libertarians were so upset about. It's mandating that people go out and do what? The state is mandating that they go out and purchase health insurance and, and some of these exchanges that they don't have an employer uh, employment-based um, health insurance. So that market, which is now there, is itself a creation in many ways of the the VACA, right? Um, so it can, so even if the market is there, it's certainly not natural, and it's right uh, for, for modification, intervention, and abolition. Uh, so to me, that's the, the precise example. The continued existence of the private health insurance uh, uh, market is precisely demonstrating how artificial um, the market is. It's not, it's not natural um, at all. Um, thanks. It was a real pleasure to listen to the talk. I, I think I was convinced and understood both the freedom to talk about the freedom from work and the way in which an active welfare state enables the freedom from a heterosexual private family. Um, but I was wondering, and maybe I didn't totally pick up on it, if you see these as two parallel arguments about two different periods, or if they're somehow in a future relationship. Can I say both? <laughs> I, I don't think they're the same. And I, I think that's one really important uh, point that I want to make in the paper, is that freedom cannot be confined to a particular or singular moment of emancipation, which I, I try to elaborate on. A, a, a bit more uh, in the writing, but simply, um, you know, uh, abolishing capital, the Marxist fantasy of the end of history, um, does not necessarily abolish, um, say, uh, 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 heteronormativity. Uh, there have been scholars doing some work on the ways in which um, homophobia functioned as a critical component of consolidating socialist states in the, in the 20th century, uh, in which uh, queer people were considered as bourgeois contaminants, right? So the, even an anti-capitalist understanding of political freedom uh, can't necessarily touch 
uh, the queer question, uh, the question of queer freedom. And you can imagine, and we've seen regimes in the history in, in which they're figured as antagonistic. So you could have an entirely um, heteronormative uh, family model uh, existing within a, a socialized um, economy. So I, for me, it's very important to keep them uh, uh, distinct, um, even if perhaps in the, the moment we might find c connections between them. But to really insist on um, distinction and the pluralization of the question of freedom, I, I think it can't be emphasized enough, especially after the 20th century. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Jack. Um, so I have uh, two questions that I'll keep quite brief. Um, the first is sort of back to this question of the, the queer freedom. Um, I'm interested in what you think of queer parents and, and, and their role within these, um, uh, this emancipation of the material family. Um, not least in that the ACA doesn't actually provide reproductive assistance for queer parents. So folks are looking to create their own family, in this case, lesbians. Um, that's not an avenue open for us. How does that complicate your analysis in trying to kind of think through uh, not just the queer child, but the key, the, the queer being reduced from the burden of the biological, but those that are actually seeking to reduce their own biological family? Um, uh, given that it does remain out of that sort of reach. And this is, my second question is kind of related to this. Uh, not least that we have a very global audience in here. Uh, there's something about the sort of exceptionalism of America as being one of the last countries to, to, to move forward in having any kind of like, universal. Uh, medical coverage, um, and how would your analysis be enriched or um, complicated by looking at uh, locations where we've long had single payer health systems, like most of Europe, like in Canada, and how have debates around these questions of uh, um, disciplinary mechanisms for welfare, as you talk about, um, how, how would it work, how would, have those been worked through in other locations, and how might that help you? Because it, it, it's it's, it's, it's a very American discussion, I think, and it's fit here in North America. But I, I just did, I know that scholars and other locations have really thought through this. How do we leave neoliberalism and the operations of, of neoliberal techniques of, of market around healthcare um, in locations where that, I mean, to Fred's point, it actually, the market has not played a role, even in complicated um, um, intermediary roles, even in, 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 in play at all, because it hasn't actually marketized it's been safe for life. Yeah, um, those are great questions. Thank you. Uh, I, I gave the paper um, at the American Political Science Association in um, August, and Jennifer Nadelsky from the University of Toronto was in the audience. We were having this conversation. And finally, she was, what's wrong with you Americans? I, I always forget how terrible it is when I come south of the border that you don't have um, a health insurance. So you're, you're quite right that there's something very particular. And there's a whole literature on the exceptionality of the United States. Why, why does the United States not have a socialist party? history of state repression part. Why does the, the United States not have a, a welfare state? There's an entire um, comparative literature on that. Um, I think it's a missing part of my analysis, to be quite honest. Um, but I, I do think the, um, the thinking could benef would benefit, this could would benefit by a more comparative, um, a comparative approach to think about, um, OK, so and, and systems with single payer or un universal with private insurance, much more universal. Uh, the, United, the United States, even with the ACA, um, what would freedom look like? Um, in most places with uh, single payer um, systems where the distribution has not been tethered to, or has no longer tethered to the employer relationship, <coughs> you do find greater worker freedom. I, 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 you look at un rates of unionization, um, look at uh, basic um, you know, infant mortality. There, there's a whole um, set of uh, um, uh, I, I lag at where the indicators of social well-being in the United States compared to countries with more robust uh, social democratic welfare states, even if they're less rich per capita, uh, seems to me to be um, quite telling. Now, that might still be a different question than the question of freedom. Um, and so at this point, I, I, I would be a more scholarly in, in, in investigation. I only have anecdotes of uh, friend, friends who are always bewildered and have more, they can actually be artists. Um, because they don't have to worry about um, losing their health care. So my concern with artists actually came from living um, in an art collective in, in San Francisco and having people come over uh, from other countries. So people from France would be like, you should be receiving state subsidy. If you were in Paris, this art space would have state subsidy. Uh, we had people in the art collective uh, who were taking out student loans at the community college to pay for health care, you know, to kind of fake enroll. So the, the anecdotally, um, I, I do think there's a significant difference for, for freedom. 
um, when one has access to basic um, social goods. Um, going back to the question of uh, queer freedom and the ACA's lack of um, uh, assistance uh, for, for reproductive technologies, um, I'm always a little bit of a danger giving this talk and that I, I seem so exuberant about the ACA. And one reason I feel very exuberant about the ACA is I think that many people on the political left have missed, uh, missed what I think is important. So what I'm pulling out here and thinking about the ACA are what are some primary political principles and how are they manifesting themselves materially in this law? That doesn't require me to embrace the law, but as I actually think the ACA suffers from many infirmities. I think it's exclusion in terms of subsidies and Medicaid uh, to immigrants without documentation is a xenophobic crime. Uh, the ACA also continues the Hyde Amendment and extends its reach, actually, in really pernicious ways. Um, so I, I don't want to oversell the ACA. So the, the example you give, I think I could take the principle of trying to think queer freedom vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the biofamilial and extend it to actually argue with you for that to be extended um, uh, legislatively, that, that particular um, material. Um, so I'm thinking the democratic here um, in a couple of, of, of ways. So I don't have a single answer to the definition of what is democracy. It'd be, it'd be an entire semester seminar wouldn't it, to even try and think the question. Um, but let me try and address it. I think first the question of democracy in this context um, is a, what might call it, say, a post-New Deal conceptualization of democracy. That is, the, the, the democratic, the political, the state. Um, can actually intervene into what used to be called civil society, the private realm, in order to regulate and redistribute in that realm on behalf of the many. And that, and that is not simply allow nature, we'll put that in scare quotes, nature to take its course, and if the nature of the market takes its course and we have radical inequality and radical forms of domination, that's okay. The only role of the state is to enforce contracts or, or police around it property, right, and that's the, the old critique of rights. So when I'm saying democratic, I, I mean democratic in the sense of against and over the market, uh, a, a, a very um, post-New Deal um, um, conceptualization that uh, Justice Ginsburg really, I think, revived in hopeful ways. Um, if, so, so to put this for, for, for law students in here doctrinally, um, you know, it's the Commerce Clause after 1940. Um, to, to, to me, is a, a conceptualization of democracy that I'm trying um, to embrace very much here. Um, I'm also embracing democracy in some sense as a consequentialist move. That is, not entirely, but in some sense, a consequentialist move, that it's actually a redistribution uh, to the many. Um, the, the, the program is actually for the many. 
uh, uh, the contrast I was trying to make between the citizens of Citizens United. So the, the two, the insistence that the political actually has primacy and legitimacy over the economic, which it itself is creating. That's the ideological thing that's being pierced by vulnerability theory, by feminist theory, by Marxist um, critique, I guess. Um, so I, I think those are the two, two important components of um, the definition of democracy uh, that I want to try and press forward um, here. And to see it as a good, not a danger. Whereas if you look at the, the conservatives in NFIB versus Sebelius, it's the great danger. It's the great danger that Milton Friedman, uh, the, the chief architectural theorist of neoliberalism, says explicitly the real danger is democracy. The less democracy we have, the better. Because the less democracy, that means more markets, individuals contracting. So it's a push against um, the idea that democracy is the problem. I, I think in an uh, age of uh, inequality and domination, it's the only hope. The only hope. Thanks so much, Thank you.